very intense. I like to keep things chill. I can be chill. Just like a manly man. Dark forces at the heart of Egyptian society, a touching and tragic study of friendship and a bromantic comedy. That's all coming up in today's film show. And for that, I'm joined by Lisa Nesselson. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Olivia. Now, we're starting with Boy From Heaven. This premiered in the Cannes Film Festival this year. It won the Best Screenplay Prize there. It's set in Egypt, but it was actually shot in Turkey because it does involve some harsh criticism of the collusion between the Egyptian authorities and the religious authorities there. This is a thriller, so the stakes are constantly shifting. What did you make of it? Oh, I got swept up in this story of Adam, a fisherman's son in a small rural community who finds himself with a scholarship to go to Cairo to attend Al-Azhar, the ultra-prestigious religious academy that trains bright young men for key positions. It's the epicenter of Sunni power. Adam has just begun classes when the university's head imam dies. The imam is said to be as powerful for Muslims as the Pope is for Catholics. If he issues a fatwa, it is taken seriously. The government needs to make certain that when the new imam is elected, it will be somebody they can work with to maintain control. The state needs an informant inside the school. Modest, unassuming, and seemingly unambitious Adam finds himself embroiled in scary layers of allegiances. Others underestimate him because, after all, he's just a poor fisherman's son. Mm, it's a very very murky atmosphere, if I remember mm. correctly. Well, let's take a look at the moral maze. Adam has to negotiate in Boy From Heaven. بعدين تنزل المهندسين شارع جامعة الدول في كافيه هناك معروف قوي now, Elazar was built in the 10th century and is the most important place to study Islam in the world, began as a Shiite establishment. But in the 12th century, it became a Sunni stronghold. And without consulting the local population, well, foreigners have been helping themselves to Egypt and what it has to offer over the centuries. Now, the director of this film said he was inspired by the book The Name of the Rose by Umberto Eco, which is set in a monastery. He wondered what would happen if he put it in a similar setting in an Islamic context. The story is about Egypt, as we know, but it was funded by Sweden, France and Finland. The director lives in Sweden. His mother is Swedish. His father is Egyptian. But he says that as of 2015, if he sets foot in Egypt, he'll be arrested. Indeed, yeah. Well, we asked him about that at the Cannes Film Festival when he presented the film there. Here's more from Tarek Saleh himself. I have a privilege. I have a Swedish passport, you know. And I think it's my duty to be a free artist. I don't look at myself as a Swedish director. I don't look at myself as a, uh, an American director or an Egyptian director. I see myself as a Korean director or a Mexican director, you know? And I look up at these guys and I say, they tell the stories without holding back. They don't think about consequences. So why should I think about consequences? It's not the provocation. And. Actor Faris Faris, the guy with the amazingly geometric nose, who here works for the Egyptian Secret Service, has lived in Sweden since he was 14 and his family fled Lebanon. So take that, people who believe that immigration is an awful thing that somehow dilutes the national population and talent pool. This film is full of interesting twists, many of which involve hypocrisy at the highest level. Mm, I found it immensely enjoyable. Well, now to a film that shows some of the harrowing consequences of feeling forced to conform. It's called Close. And it, it won the Grand Prix in Cannes. It was chosen to represent Belgium for the Oscars. It won two major prizes just a few days ago at the Chicago International Film Festival. Is this the kind of movie that wins prizes or hearts or both? Both. I'd say both. Most people find Luca Dant's second feature deeply moving. It's about two boys enjoying their incredibly strong friendship, riding bicycles, running through fields. If there's such a thing as purity and innocence, they embody it. Close is about the living, breathing beauty of connecting with another human, especially when you're young and you're still building your personal catalog of experiences and coping mechanisms. Leo and Remy are 13-year-old boys and they relish doing boy stuff together. Indeed. Well, let's take a look at the atmosphere in Close. Blonde 
Est-ce que je peux poser une question Est-ce que vous êtes ensemble Mais pourquoi tu dis ça Parce que ça nous tente tout. Enfin, je sais pas. Bah, on s'est rapprochés parce qu'on est sûr. Sûr et certain. It certainly looks wholesome, but what goes wrong with this idyllic relationship? Oh, the passage of time and the butting in of catty classmates parlaying sexual innuendo, what was uh, innuendo, what was innocent and completely fulfilling becomes suspicious. And what are these two really up to? Why doesn't society just mind its own business? <laughs> Indeed. Okay, we'll leave the... Uh... No spoilers there. Well, now to a film billed as the Hollywood studio back picture in which all of the actors and many members of the crew are openly queer. Bros is set in New York and it deals with the challenges of being a gay man in your 40s. It got a great reception at the Toronto Film Festival a couple of months ago. There were rumours about possible Oscar attention. Then it came out in American theatres. What happened next? Uh, basically, hardly anybody showed up to buy a ticket. It was labeled a spectacular flop, and Twitter musings about homophobia proliferated. Some people think there's no need for a film about gay men because, at least in Western countries, queer people are now integrated into society. In the same year the movies were invented, 1895, Oscar Wilde, one of the most famous and accomplished writers on Earth, was sent to prison for alleged homosexual acts. It demolished his health. He died young. Our loss. So, Universal Studios making and promoting an all-queer romantic comedy is a sort of milestone. But I don't care about that. All I know is that when I went to a sold-out show in central Paris the day it was released, I laughed a lot, as did a self-selecting audience of mostly gay French men. The humor is very American, and I think the structure functions just fine to professional men. Flamboyantly intellectual arts administrator Bobby and Aaron, an impossibly handsome hunk who works in estate planning, each catch each other's eyes. Both are up for casual sex, but skittish about emotional commitment. Okay, well, t let's take a look. This is Bros. What are you into? One of these ripped idiots with no opinions? No, I'd like someone who's physically very frail and won't stop talking. And I bet he's as intimidated by you as you are by him. I'm down for whatever. Yeah, I can do whenever and I can do whatever. Cool, whatever, whenever. GIF of Michael Scott dancing. Office GIF? This person isn't gay. I, spent all my years I need you to be honest with me. You like these rowy meathead idiots. Oh, look, they're fighting. Do you like that? Hey. I can be tough oh, like your you boys. Like oh, like that's what you like, huh? Oh, oh, hey, hey, what's going on? Oh, that's cool. Bye-bye. Now, if you believe in the male gaze, this is absolutely the male gaze applied to males. With the resources of a studio, it looks great. The ugly characters look great. The attractive characters look even better. It's the affected Jewish guy who brims with self-confidence and the handsome Gentile guy who's more withdrawn and low-key. And it touches on the fact that if you have one of those bodies, steroids are probably involved. Some nicely incorporated guest appearances augment Pop culture influences from movies, TV, music. These are successful people with nice apartments and discretionary income, and they still have complicated love lives. Who knew? The film makes fun of romantic comedies while being one. Now, some people think it negotiates that slippery slope well. I'm one of them. Others think it fails utterly. I had been slightly put off by the trailer, but genuinely enjoyed this. It was a really nice surprise. Okay, it does sound like fun. Now, we're staying with comedy and going to a feature from Francis Weber, one of France's most successful writer-directors. Plenty of his films have been adapted into English, including his first film, Le Jouet, The Toy, in 1982. It's been remade again now. In French, it's called Le Nouveau Jouet, <laughs> so the new toy. Tell us why. Uh, I don't know whether it's good news or bad news that the story here is every bit as pertinent as it was in 1976 when an ultra-wealthy industrialist gave his spoiled son another human being, played by master of physical comedy Pierre Richard, as a toy to play with. Richard Pryor played the human toy in the 1982 American remake, of, and 40 years ago it was social commentary and not an insult that a black man was assigned to be a white boy's subservient plaything. In the just-released update, Daniel Otoy's son wants the security watchman at Dad's luxury 
department store as a toy. Comic ace Jamel Debouz plays the gift who initially has no interest in giving up his own life to be at the beck and call of a much higher class, but who, while discovering that money can't buy everything, learns that it sure can buy a lot. Jamel Debouz, who plays the toy, if you're unfamiliar with him, he's one of the most beloved and highest paid and talented comedians in France. He lost the use of one arm in a childhood accident, but absolutely nothing can hold him back from entertaining. Mm, that's right, he's endlessly watchable. Thank you very much for this week's Roundup, Lisa. We'll leave you with a glimpse of the new toy. Remember, you can get more movie news on our website and our social media feeds. There's more news coming up on France 24 just after this. Dans la vie, quand on aime bien les gens, on l'exprime. Vous approchez de la personne, vers la famille, tranquille, le père les... les, les... <coughs> Fake news, noun. False stories that appear to be news spread on the internet or using other media. At France 24, our job is to provide you with information that's been verified. We check sources, we check facts, we sort what is true from what is fake. At the France 24 observers, we verify photos and videos circulating online. If they're fake, we let you know and tell you how we spotted them. In fact or fake, we dig into viral stories around Europe to shake out the truth from the trash. Every day, the InfoMigrants team scours social networks to fight fake news about the reality of migration. France 24. News based on facts. Liberté, égalité, actualité. I'm Sarah Morris, France 24 correspondent in Madrid. I cover Spain and Portugal, two countries recovering from painful recessions, but now being challenged by the political and social fallout from those years. Watch me on Live from Paris and France 24 news programs. Sarah Morris, one of the 200 France 24 correspondents around the world.